Okay, so let's start. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Kosten Atman. Uh, well, Kosten um, did his studies and his PhD in the University of Munster in the group of Professor Lange, who is one of the pioneers in, in, in optical pattern formation, I would say. He got his PhD in 1996. Uh, and afterwards, he, well, he stayed in, in Munster, but he did several visits in Nice for a year in 1998. <coughs> Then he spent also uh, a number of months here, I think 10 months or something like that, in 1990 or so, in, in the uh, Department of Physics of India. And well, and eventually in 2005, he moved to Stuttgart uh, with a, a permanent position where, where he is a reader now yeah, at the University of Stuttgart. Well, Tosten has done a lot of activities. He's experimentalist, and he's, uh, he's mainly uh, work on nonlinear dynamics of lasers and pattern formation also, where well, I, I will say that he has always been a, a, a reference for this type of experiments that we have followed very much. We have had several collaborations on, on that topic. So well, uh, I just give you the word and he will tell uh, about his activity in, in Strasbourg and, and before on non-linear photonics in the surface emitter laser. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation. So I think we discovered roughly that it's 10 years ago that was the last year for a longer time, maybe too long. But anyway, here I am again and I enjoy it very much. So I am with the Department of Physics of Strathclyde. We are part on the one hand of SUPER, that is the uh, Scottish University Physics Alliance and uh, uh, part of the Institute of Complex Systems activities are in and uh, I'm an instrumentalist, uh, so and that is called the Photonics Group. Yeah. I would like to talk today about nonlinear photonics in a special kind of semiconductor laser and speak mainly about solitons and I thought it appropriate at this place to speak also about spin effects in these lasers. Some people might enjoy hearing of that since 10 years ago or so. Okay, so I want to give a brief introduction, probably I can be quite brief here, on why we investigate these what area lasers and the instabilities in them. Then review what we did before on the cavity solid on laser, that is, so we can optical control small lasers, can change, switch them on and off by optical means, show some modeling, modeling and simulations, and then I explain to you that real systems are a little bit dirty, so we are fighting disorder there. Uh, on the other hand, that enables us to do investigations on frequency and phase locking uh, in these lasers. And uh, these are the current, stability, uh, current activities, which is a close connection here to Palmer. And we find an atlas scenario for frequency and phase locking of these solitons in our devices. And then I want to show some more uh, applied aspects. So in this week, it's uh, also spin degrees are of importance. And uh, we propose a method to, uh, for fast modulation of uh, semiconductor lasers based on uh, uh, not relaxation oscillations of intensity, but on self oscillations due to spin and polarization dynamics. And this can be controlled by, by fringes in these uh, Devices. So this is currently more fundamental character, and that is uh, in some sense still fundamental, but with some more applied uh, aim, short term applied, uh, shorter term applied aim. That's what this is. So what we try in nonlinear photonics as flash that is to understand, control, and utilize the nonlinearities and complexity in nonlinear optics, especially but not only in view of semiconductor-based devices. And uh, my main work is probably still the cavity soliton laser and the focus of this talk. Then I did a lot of work on polarization properties of Vixels, especially coupling spatial and polarization degrees of freedom. And here in this talk, I want to talk about this aspect of self oscillations to spin dynamics, as I explained already. Then uh, we have a newly starting project on self organization in cold atomic vapors, and just to briefly explain that the new thing to the hot vapor switch was done before is that there's optical mechanical coupling 
So these cold atoms are so cold that they feel the light forces and they will start to move in response to the pattern formation of the light. You will get density gratings of atoms in addition to the usual refractive index gratings. Uh, that is currently theory, but we are working on experimental realization. realization. Then we do terahertz generation by different frequency mixing, and I had a project on quantum dot devices exploring non optics there, and also terahertz generation. And so these are the devices we are looking at me, uh, in this talk. They are called vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, vertical cavity, because the growth of the semiconductor is in this direction, so, uh, and the gain medium are a few semiconductor quantum belts, which are very thin, they're indicated in red here, <coughs> the emission is orthogonal to this uh, gain medium uh, in the direction of the epitaxial growth. Since these quantum wells are so thin, so roughly 24 nanometers, you need a lot of reflectivity to compensate for this small gain. So you grow layers of alternating lambda by quarter, lambda by four stacks of an alternating refractive index, 33 or 21, which form rack reflectors. And these rack reflectors have a reflectivity of 99.5% or so. So that closes the high finesse cavity in that direction. And then the emission in our devices is through the substrate that enables us to have a high, quite high current uniformities here. So the current, current is induced by metallic contact on you know, the top of the P mesa of the P bracket stack and then going through the substrate and the current distribution in here is quite homogeneous. And uh, it's not drawn like that, but we'll see. So we can make this size quite large, 200 microns. Uh, this size is only one micron. So that means this laser will have lots of opportunities to do transverse uh, structures in this plane. So the technological implementation is then again slightly more complicated. In order to get the heat out of the, out of the device, you need to solder a diamond on top of this laser, and then that is attached to a, a, a copper submount to take the heat out. And just again, to remind you of that, this area is 200 micron. The effective cavity length is only 1.2 micron. So you should think of it as a very, very flat disk and not as a tube, or uh, so what uh, maybe normal lasers look like. So lots of opportunities for these transverse patterns. And just uh, to give you an impression that that is how it looks in reality. Uh, so this is a mesa, this is a metallic contact. Somewhere here would be the gain medium. And here you see these uh, alternating layers, refractive index on the order of 200 nanometer thickness. And then this whole thing is this small thing that is soldered on this diamond and then on this other submount and electrical contact. And then these devices from an application point of view have quite a significant output power, 4.6 <coughs> watts, something like that. And if you look at the far field emission of these devices, it looks also reasonably uh, fine, uh, single humps, roughly above, uh, far above threshold and reasonably well behaved, and it's only uh, until you realize that this is quite, big, quite wide, you realize that this is not a very good laser for applications. And engineers express that as a uh, size uh, bandwidth product. So this is the size of the, of the emission. In our case, it would be 200 micron. This is emission angle. So you can measure that, this is 10 degree, uh, or 20 degree, whatever you take as, uh, as a criterion, and then you can multiply that and get a number, and for a fundamental mode, which you could focus to a wavelength size or so, this product would be 1, and for this device it's 50. So this is 50 times wider in emission 
then uh, for a well behaved device and therefore they are still not very far in applications but they are uh, meant to come into applications between incoherent lamps and the traditional laser domain there might be a niche for, for this kind of lasers but as I said currently this is not the case so this is very nice engineering and the engineers are still trying to get these devices a little bit better but our approach is very different so we, we are thinking of can we funnel these instabilities leading to this uh, multi-mode broadening in some self-localized robot, robust entities and for the non-dynamics community this would be a solid. So the work on the cavity soliton laser in the experiment is currently done by Johan Notlet in my group. Uh, older experiments were done by Neil who finished in 2010. The devices are coming from own photonics. We have theoretical support by Kate McIntyre, Willi First and John Lucke at Strasse-Clyde. Then a lot of work was done by Pavel Paolo over the uh, last years and he was partially in Minsk, partially at Strasse-Clyde, partially here and now he is in Berlin. And we have support from uh, Damian and Perre and uh, some of the early work was done in collaboration with this. I'll tell you about work in, in the next. Okay, as I said, I will be very brief on this. So we all know the spatial soliton in propagation, where the diffraction, the natural diffraction of the beam is compensated by phase cell focusing due to a nominal refractive index. And the thing is that the length scale, the size of the soliton is determined only by the linearity, and there's a family of solutions. Then if you think of this medium, uh, it's in principle infinite to see the soliton, close it by mirrors, then you replace the propagation by time evolution in this cavity, and since the mirrors are leaking, you need to compensate by driving, and that gives you another condition that not only nonlinearity and diffraction needs to uh, cancel, uh, compensate but also dissipation and gain. And that means the family contracts to a single solution we have an attractor. And that is one approach to this uh, dissipative solitons, uh, soliton in box, as ever promoted by the Lee a few years ago. And the other interpretation comes more from general structure formation, so if you have any bistable system and then think of it in extended space and part of it can be in the upper state, part of it can be in lower state. In between there's necessarily a front. These fronts can move and sometimes they lock together to form this localized state or dissipative soliton and whatever you want to call it. So these two approaches, one more for the optics guys, one more for the guys coming from back information. So the archaeotypical system this was in investigated was a cavity, it's <coughs> not in a medium, for example a semiconductor, two mirrors driven by an external beam. And uh, the disadvantage of this system is that uh, you need this beam of high temporal and spatial coherence. And the other thing is that the solitons coming out of it are a little bit dull because their frequency, phase, and polarization is locked to their holding beam. So the suggestion was get rid of the holding beam, pump incoherently, and then you extract the inner energy from a cheaper incoherent source. But at the same time, the additional benefit is you get that frequency, phase, and polarization of these solitons are free and become dynamical variables. And uh, going back a little bit, so from the soliton point of view, what could that mean? So in the coherently driven systems, we have two interacting. We know that takes place by these rings, which you can see here. But the phase is not important. For propagation of solitons, they are phase insensitive interaction, but they are in phase. We have the sequence of attraction and repulsion out of phase solitons simply uh, 
uh, repel each other. And so laser cell cavity solitons would combine both of these features, uh, potentially at least, and uh, phase, location, and polarization are free to change during dynamics, but are not uh, put in like in these propagation ones from the start. And some of these aspects I want to talk about in this talk. Okay, then there's a small uh, technical problem. The laser is not bistable at threshold, but has a continuous switch on. Therefore, to get it bistable, you need to add a little bit. One possibility is the absorption. One possibility is the frequency selective filter. And one is a little bit of injection. But that is not good because you mix again a little bit coherent beam. So these are the real cavity soliton lasers where the phase is completely free. And we went for this because it can be realized with uh, broad area pixels and uh, off the shelf optical elements and demonstrated the first semiconductor based cavity soliton laser in 2018. Okay. So now the experiment, a little bit more in detail. So we have here our Vixel. We have a telescope. This telescope images the output of the Vixel onto a frequency selective element. That's a volume break rating. You see here this notch. So here we have a high reflectivity in a small wavelength range, and otherwise it's transmitting. And this self imaging kills diffraction in the external cavity and maintains the high Fresnel number, the high aspect ratio of the mixer I talked about earlier. And then we can in inject another uh, beam from outside, which can be pulsed by using the acoustical optical modulator. So what is the mechanism of the bi bi stability? We have here a frequency. This is the frequency of the grating. This is the longitudinal resonance of the mixer. And these are the high order modes of the mixer, they are at high frequencies. So initially we have a gap, and then that is a condition where the laser is off. Then imagine there's a fluctuation, the laser switch is on, that reduces the carry density, that increases the refractive index. If you look at the equation for the resonance of a Fabry Perot, increasing refractive index means the, res uh, the resonance frequency becomes smaller. So that means the resonance of this laser jumps towards the resonance of the grating and then can be self-sustained with the same parameters as it can be off. So that explains you the bistability. And here you see this bistability. So here's current. Here's the total output power of the laser. You start with something where the laser is completely off. Then you have here a small abrupt step that is one peak, next abrupt step, there's a second peak, and then there are more and more abrupt steps where you see additional peaks appearing, and it goes into some uh, extended states, and if you return, you see that uh, the power goes off again in uh, these abrupt steps, and each of these steps is one of these peaks is appearing or disappearing. You see that for one current, there is by a mighty stability, so here you have only one spot on at the same current, uh, here there are plenty. So each of these points is locally bistable and globally you have a high mighty stability because uh, we have plenty of these positions. And each of these lasers has a quite well-defined uh, shape, around 5 microns. The angle of this is around uh, 57, uh, 60 milliradians, and that is nearly diffraction limited. So they have nearly perfect beam quality. The theory is that it should be uh, perfect, but more or less on the experimental level, we can't distinguish between them. Yeah. So we have a high spatial coherence, much higher than the uh, full pixel, and the line width in frequency space is 6 megahertz. So we have all also a high temporal coherence. So 6 megahertz are uh, line bits which is typical for grating control lasers. So each of these guys is a small coherent emitter and micro laser. And now we can ask, and I will answer that later, what is the uh, mutual coherence between the guys? 
So that we are going to discuss later. Each of these guys is a small microlens. And what I will show you here is now we inject these external beams, switch it off, on and off, and then the soliton survives. We do that at uh, multiple positions on soliton survives, external beam there, soliton survives, writing the third one, erasing that again, erasing that guy, writing the second guy here, erasing that guy, and that again. So what you have seen here is three solitons. Uh, each has two, uh, two possible states. So you can have eight two to the three possible bit states. And you can read and uh, write and erase them all independently of each other what these things demonstrate. So again, writing the first one, injection off, survives. Second one, third one. Erase that guy, erase that guy, setting this pair which didn't exist alone before, erasing that and erasing that. That shows that independent of each other, they have some solitonic character. And now this is more for demonstration. We leave the writing beam on and move it across the laser. And then you see we can switch solitons on and off. We can see also that we can move them between different positions. So there, that, that is setting them, uh, erasing them now again. Okay. And you see that they are actually attracted to this, to this writing beam because it produces a change of refractive index by a change of carriers. So and therefore, they're moving. Yeah. I, mean, I thought they were. What's the difference between writing and erasing? I thought it was the face of the writing beam, but no. this is not. What, what here, it, here it's not. We are currently working on some more control things. So here you just see that you can move them from one point to the other. So the idea currently is the laser is not completely homogeneous, but it has variations across the cavity due to growth fluctuations. And these guys live in minima of this potential created by the growth fluctuations. And what the writing beam does is attracting them. And if you attract them to a point where they can't exist, mm -hmm. then they die after you leave it out. Mm -hmm. And so this thing is uh, rotation symmetric on average. It depends on the disorder where you can erase them or uh, delete them. If you want to delete them in space, the problem is. Uh, actually, because they can choose their own face, that's a problem. If you, if you have your external reference, you can change the face of the reference and delete them. But if they choose their face themselves, then you would need to tune an external laser very carefully to the frequency and the face, and that is not stable. What we are currently working on is uh, using a beam which is uh, at much higher energy, and inject carriers. And injecting carriers should also give you a control switch on, switch off, hitting the same position where the soliton is. So the writing beam takes away carriers as it's now, in increasing the refractive index. And if you could put uh, uh, by optical pumping some carriers uh, at the same position, you could fill this again, decrease the refractive index, and that should enable us to do uh, control switching with all this trick, uh, which is currently used. So this is an uh, untidy field. I agree. But it, it, it illustrates that actually they're living in a disordered landscape, and you can move them from one trap to the other, or if you, if you attract them in the next trap, or you can uh, move them to death by putting them in a desert or so where they, where they can, can live. And this idea of disorder is supported if you measure the frequencies, they are a little bit different. The first soliton is quite different, it has also quite different threshold, and then you, you measure slightly different frequencies. So they are mutually incoherent. And you can understand that by this 
uh, what I explained before, you have these dispersion curves of the Vixel. If the Vixel has this order, every point has a slightly different dispersion curve. And the one where the uh, Vixel dispersion curve is closest to the grating is the point where it switches first on. And then where the uh, dispersion curves are displaced, these are the points where it switches on later. And the solitons have a slightly higher stuff. And you can use that then to create a map. So we are measuring at what point the different structures are switching on. And then you see this Tramontana landscape. Uh, so it doesn't look very nice. But these are essentially monolayer fluctuations of the groups. So it's something you can't really control. And we propose that it can be used to get a, a quite quick rough overview on the relative disorder in the Vixel wafer is fairly high resolution. That was recently published in Optics Letters. OK. So then a little, a little bit on theory. So we are modeling the Vixel by uh, normal rate equations for the uh, optical fields and the carriers. So you have diffraction of the optical field, you have losses, you have the detuning, you have here the carriers which have gain and very important this frequency shift depending on the carriers which is responsible for the visibility as I explained. And then the carriers have diffusion which we neglect uh, they have stimulated emission, decreasing the number of carriers, and then injection via the, via the current and non-relative copy combination. These equations are stiff. There's a factor of 100 between the two time, uh, between the time sticks. And that is important later, actually. Okay, and then we have this feedback field. This feedback field uh, has uh, a term which is standard. This is a time-delayed field after one round trip in this external cavity uh, multiplied with the transmission factor here. That is called the Lan Kobayashi uh, uh, approximation. And uh, for many years there was uh, the wisdom if you wanted to include additional orders that you needed to add uh, two time delays, three time delays, and so on, an infinite sum. But, uh, what, based on earlier works of Salvador Valle here, we found is that you can take a single uh, memory term without any extra uh, computational penalty, and that is a feedback field delayed by one round trip that allows you to take into account all orders, as I said, with essentially uh, any additional pe penalty. And that, that would be a normal mirror. And then you have here a green function for the grating. Uh, this would dis uh, display a sync, uh, sync transmission function. So if you convert this uh, temporal integral to a, uh, to, a, to, a, to a frequency space, you get the same uh, problem. You know, most of you know that better than I do. Okay, and then you find uh, here are the uh, transverse wave numbers, depending on, on, on frequency, this is the threshold current, depending on frequency. Here you have essentially the solitary laser. Uh, here you have the grating controlled modes. You see that the threshold is lowest for some transverse wave number uh, uh, belonging to the grating controlled modes. And in between the solitary laser modes and its grating controlled modes is a gap extended to you qualitatively before in the, in the diagrams. And if you put your uh, put that on the computer, then you calculate in 1D or 2D uh, stable localized structures. Here's uh, space, here's time, and in this case it would be station. And the bits increase uh, roughly a few parameters which are not exactly known as experimental observation. And then theoreticians want to, want to have it easier. So uh, there's no justification for it. 
principle you can't do that, but if you want, you can remove the carry equation, do an ad adiabatic elimination. As I explained to you, actually the the ratio is actually the other way around. It's uh, 10 to minus 2 and not 100, so there's no justification to do that, but it works. Uh, uh, so you, you can reduce that to a class A laser and uh, add the feedback like Kobayashi still works and you can put a low and single hand filter for simplicity uh, whatever. So this uh, captures the essentials of the experiment. And the idea of that, it's known that in the complex means for blunder equation, if you would neglect even the saturation, uh, solitons are solutions but unstable, and you need something to stabilize the background, and this linear filter is doing that. So that stabilizes you the solitons. And then you can put that onto the computer. These are these... Uh, off-axis mode I talked about in the full model, so there's some spatial temporal disorder uh, centered on a finite k. And if you move then your parameter, pump parameter in this gap between the free running states and these uh, extended states, uh, this thing uh, simplifies, you get these uh, localized states centered around k with zero, also in the simplified model. In the simplified model, you can do continuation analysis, and here you find a uh, branch of the solitons emerging from the uh, uh, zero solution, turning around and merging again with the zero solution. This happens at infinite widths, and then uh, the solitons become smaller here, and in, in between here and here, there's existence of stable solitons. Here, there's an instability to moving solitons. And the frequency of the stable ones is close but a little bit bluish to, to the peak of the gate. And uh, again, the parameters don't match one to one, but the width is roughly in the 10 to 30 micrometers. Okay, so just to summarize this, we have circular symmetric microlasers, which are very similar to beam parameters. They are bistable and optical controllable, show some mobility, and they can be interpreted as laser cavity solitons. Their shape is essentially self localized, but the position of the threshold is influenced by the disorder. This is validated in class A and class B models, in 1D and 2D, and they exist in the gap where the non-lasing background is stabilized by the frequencies like the filter. And due to the disorder, these different solitons are incoherent, and now we can ask ourselves, how can that change by non-linearity and coupling? So can we have frequency locking, phase locking? So can they synchronize? And so this was invest investigated first uh, in the simplified model, and uh, yeah, since the audition wants to have it even simpler, they neglect separation, and we end up with a higgs Blando model, uh, stabilized by this frequency electric feedback, and then we put here a pinning potential, which describes this order, so which would describe that the detuning fluctuates of the translate uh, part. And if you look first in the homogeneous model, this is the profile of a soliton in the logarithmic scale, and this is the face, so uh, it's sharped, it's a dissipative soliton, and then if you bring two group together, you can illustrate that in something which is called the interaction plane. This is L, the distance, times the cosine of the face between the two soliton, and L times the face of the two soliton. And what you find in the homogeneous system is that they are foci, it's a phase difference of pi by two, and they are stable. And then you have saddled with a phase difference of zero and phase difference of pi, and they are unstable. And they have alternating stability, either they are position unstable, this guy, but phase stable, or they are position stable, but phase unstable. 
And this is very much the same what was found before in a cubic quintic Higgs boson equation, which is meant to mimic separable absorption as a method to stabilize the background. And then, if you put the traps, uh, you find at certain distances that they lock in antiphase. So what you see here is time. This is the initial phase. They are initiated, relative phase, and then you see they all merge to a common solution, which is this pi phase shift. And the interpretation of that is you stabilize by the trap this, uh, this saddle because it was position unstable, but due to the trap, the position of stability is removed and the phase stability remains. And uh, above a certain distance here, the pi by 2 state, as you, see, as you see, is phase unstable but position stable. So if you, at this distance, you are stabilizing by this method uh, the pi state, uh, the zero state, which is phase stable but position unstable. So that is this guy, and here you get, obviously, uh, a stable phase of zero if you start from different initial conditions. And then you can vary the depths of the two, uh, give the two traps a little bit of a different depth, which is the case in the experiment, and then you find phases which are not zero and not pi. In this example, it's 2.4 or whatever. And then if you put, do that systematically, you find that all falls on the universal curve, which agrees to the Adler curve. So you have here the detuning between the two solitons, which would be controlled by the difference in the depths of the traps they are residing in. Uh, the uh, blue points are the gates for Blano equation model. The triangles come from the class B laser model. And the uh, line comes from the Arkle equation. Uh, and you, find, you see that, except a little bit at the boundaries, they follow this after behavior more or less uh, uh, identical. And so they behave like uh, synchronized oscillators. So in the experiment, we have now the problem how to control the detuning. And we can do that not by changing the property of the vexel, vexel that is different, uh, difficult, but to change the properties of the external cavity. So we tilt just a little bit the volume rack rating on a pivot which is actually very much down here. So very far out. That changes the external cavity length and you can think of it changing the feedback phase in the model. And then uh, both solitons will change their frequency in response to this change of external cavity length. But due to the fact that they are at different distances to the pivot, they will change the frequencies at slightly different range. And by that we can compensate and control their detuning. And so a shift of this relative uh, length of the cavity by a few micrometer with a PCT changes the detuning by a few tens of megahertz. And at that smaller changes the near field and far field profiles are essentially not effective. So we don't change the solid and themselves. And that is what you see here then. So this is the tilt of the volume rack rating or the equivalent, equivalent relative detuning. So in most places you see two solitons at two different frequencies, here, here, and here. And they shift in response to this tilt in frequencies. And sometimes they jump together. So here, for example, uh, that lose, uh, mode loses stability, that soliton moves to the next longitudinal mode of the external cavity here, and at the same time that uh, soliton moves from that mode to that mode, and then they shift together again. But sometimes also you see that uh, the two modes, two modes go to a common mode. But that is a candidate for a phase-locking click. And the 
question would be, are these now two very close and maybe unresolved frequencies, are they, are they really locked? And that we can look at by looking at the far fields, so interference in far field. So here again there is a detuning, and here is the, uh, this needs to be inverse micron, so that is wrong, uh, cuts to the far field profiles. This is essentially the incoherent supervision of two solitons, so it's essentially Gaussian, and in the moment where they have, where they locked, they interfere with each other, they have same frequency, constant phase, and then you see this very, very high invisibility fringes. You can see also that during the tilt, the fringe phase changes, the fringes shift, which means the phase between the two different solitons changes. So that is here. So this proves that they are indeed uh, that they are indeed phase locked. The transition is quite abrupt. And now you can fix the phase of this, and then you extract that the visibility is high here, and the phase is very well defined in this range with high visibility, and very undefined in the ranges where the visibility is lower and you see here that it changes roughly from uh, whatever 0.8 pi to 1.5 pi and that is the range described by the after equation and the phase so this is the pi solution where the two have the same height and then the, if the phase moves away from pi you see that, that the fringe, uh, fringe pattern has different height and shifts in space. And here you have essentially no phase clearance anymore. And in the spectrum, this is essentially one peak, essentially one peak, two peaks. Okay, so that is the experimental counterpart of what I showed you uh, theoretically. So again, a small intermediate summary. Uh, partly spatial and temporal systems react very differently to disorder. In the temporal case, fiber lasers, the pi by 2 phase uh, bound states, which are predicted by the cubic Quintic Ginsburg Lando equations, are actually observed experimentally. And that is because the soliton which moves along the cavity sees all the disorder. On average, moving along the cavity, uh, along the temporal axis, both solitons see the same disorder. But of course in the spatial case, they see only the disorder locally. They don't ever sample the whole cavity. And therefore, uh, the translation modes become strongly damped, and we have this synchronization dynamics following the other scenario. And you can compare that maybe with the fireflies. So these fireflies show also the synchronization, as all of you know. But to my knowledge, actually, they keep sitting where, you, where they are. They could move, but they keep sitting where they are. And the solitons do the same in the homogeneous systems. They actually would move in response to the interaction, but due to the disorder, they are frozen and synchronized with just their phases. Actually, they move a little bit, but very, very few. Nevertheless, there are new features compared to normal lasers. They are self-localized. All these guys are bistable still. And there's a potential for the reasonable large disordered networks, which are otherwise difficult to organize if you want to couple lasers via fibers or so then you have problems to do more than three or four, and here you can have potentially uh, quite large networks. And there are ideas actually to control locally the disorder, so that we could control interaction strengths and detunings on a local level. Okay, so that is, closes the soliton part, and maybe briefly to speak about biofringence and uh, spin and mixes. So this work is done in collaboration with a group of 
Martin Hoffmann in Bochum. And it starts from the observation of Maxi here and uh, I think we provided some nice experimental illustration of that, that the spin is actually important in uh, polarization switching in, in, in Vixels. So these Vixels are isotropic devices. If this is the plane of the quantum well, in principle, uh, there's symmetry around this axis. Uh, and so the laser doesn't know should it have this polarization, that, that, or whatever. Uh, that is fixed by small anisotropies, but there can be a switching. So it decides for the one polarization, decides to switch down, the other polarization switches up. And there was a big discussion whether that is due to linear dynamics or due to nonlinear dynamics, but if you look very closely, you find that the laser power is actually uh, dropping a little bit at this polarization switching point and that means that there's nothing a normal laser would do, a normal laser always wants to uh, increase its output power if it's linear dynamics and that is uh, one of the fingerprints projected by Maxi's model for the relevance of uh, spin dynamics. Okay, and since then our uh, in parallel, there was a quite a lot of working on what's called spin optoelectronics or spintronics. People want to use also the spin degrees of freedom in addition to the number of carriers in uh, uh, communications or uh, 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 information processing, but progress is actually quite slow. So if you think of LEDs, then what you can do is roughly 3% of circular polarization or spin polarization by having some ferromagnetic injection contacts. So normal spin injection is not polarization sensitive. You have up and down spins of the characters in the same amount. So you can get roughly 3%, which is enough to bias your LED a little bit towards circular polarization. And spin vixels, spin lasers, either work only at low temperature and with a magnetic field which is bad for applications or currently only with optical injection. Uh, but there are potentials to, to do something with it. And the underlying model comes uh, from Maxi. So instead of one carrier reservoir, you have two carrier reservoirs. One has uh, in the <coughs> valence band uh, uh, magnetic quantum number of plus minus three by half, one in the conduction band of plus minus one half. Then due to angular momentum selection rules, you can only have circular polarized transitions between these two and circular polarized transitions between these two, which are described by these equations. And then in reality, there are these small perturbations of the iso uh, isotropy which couple the two circular polarizations by, by fringence and by uh, dichroism. So this is an amplitude anisotropy, this is the phase anisotropy. And then you have the total carrier number, which has a usual equation, and then an equation for the difference between the, these two reservoirs, <coughs> which is uh, a liquid data, uh, brought into equilibrium by this uh, decay rate and it's driven by the difference between the two circular polarized equations. So it's a, what I showed you before, a scalar rate equations. This is the uh, vectorial generalization. And the idea is if you have a laser which knows only about field and carriers, I told you roughly the time scale between the two is a factor of 100. This leads to relaxation oscillations, and this limits the modulation bandwidth of these devices to typical 10 to 15 gigahertz. So now in Vixels you can add polarization, and that gives you two additional time scales. One is the given by the biofringence, that's the one we are going to exploit, and the dichroism is actually a nuisance. 
So the near diagram describes the difference in amplitude and gain between the two polarization components and the biofringence is the difference in frequency between the two polarization components. And now imagine you could have both on, which is untypical for a pixel, but imagine you have both. And then you start with the initial phase of zero, which would give you a phase polarization of 45 degrees. Then one quarter of period later, it evolves to a phase difference of uh, pi by two. And then the two polarization components lock to a circular polarization. Quarter period more, you have minus 45. Then you have uh, opposite helicity. And after one period, you are back at the original phase between the two polarization components. And now you put a polarizer in front of this, and this converts this modulation of polarization state due to the biofringence to amplitude modulation. So you would see a modulation of E plus or E minus at a frequency of uh, 2 gamma p. And this can be quite high. So the unintentional di uh, biofringence is typically 8 to 20 gigahertz. But there are large numbers reported around 80 gigahertz. If you strain the devices, and there's no reason to believe that you couldn't have 100 or 200 or so. So potentially you can have very high frequencies. And as I said, the dichroism is actually a nuisance. It destroys it. So you need to look for a range of low dichroism. And Normally, the dichroism selects one polarization, so there you don't want to be. Uh, then you can find ranges of around threshold where the dichroism is small, but uh, at threshold, power is low, and polarization oscillations are strong. You don't want to be there either. And then there's this additional region where maybe not the linear dichroism is zero, but the effective nonlinear dichroism is essentially zero. And that might be a point where to look, whether we can do that. And uh, the experiment is uh, combined. One, we put most of it by electrical pumping that doesn't create a spin polarization. And then we hit it with a titanium sapphire laser with circular polarization to put a little bit of uh, spin imbalance. Uh, three picosecond pulses, and what you see then is uh, that the intensity shows some intensity relaxation oscillations, but not a lot. So you have more or less constant total intensity, but a very fast modulation of the polarization state. In our case, 11.6 gigahertz, because that was the biofringence of all excess. And these oscillations persist up to five nanoseconds. We show here two nanoseconds which is much longer than the spin lifetime, which is considered to be on the 20, 40, 50 picosecond range. And you can compare the experiment, these simulations based on the spin flip model, find very nice agreements. Uh, and the lifetime of these oscillations can be tuned by current. So, this is the simulation. This is experiment here. They live very long. That is very close to the polarization switching point. If you go away, you see that continuously they die further out. And that you can explain by the fact that the effective dichroism changes about this point where the two polarization components are equivalent. And in the simulations, we saw it up to 150 nanoseconds. In the experiment we saw it for. 5 nanoseconds, so that might be useful for clock applications, carrier waves, or if you go for the strong damping where the response is short, this might be used for modulation or communication. Okay, I finish. So I hope I convinced you that we saw small microlasers which are based on dissipative solitons, 
the optical controllable. Uh, in reality, we fight disorder, but that enables us to observe frequency and phase looking from the Atlas scenario. Currently, we are looking at coupling me mechanisms. So the theory currently contains only the evanescent tail of the solitons, but there might be additional ways to control the coupling by the external cavity. And uh, this, together with the local control of inhomogeneities, <coughs> might create very nice outlook for investigating networks of face-locked uh, laser cavity solitons. For the spin mixes, we demonstrated ultra-fast polarization dynamics after a spin angle, a perturbation of the spin balance. This can be tuned by, by fringes, and the simulations indicate that that can operate at much higher rates, uh, for sure larger than 100 gigahertz. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there is time for a question. Okay. Priority to students. Sorry. <laughs> First, any student has any question? New policy to hand. <laughs> students to make questions. Please. Please. <laughs> um, do you know how is related the coherence of these micro lasers or the length to the standard length of the laser? So we didn't investigate that very much. So you would expect that it improves with increasing cavity uh, I think we measured for a half, uh, for four nanosecond delay, so that's for five we measured slightly lower values, but there are no systematic measurements in the film of this. But you expect that it comes better if you have a long time. And more stable maybe, or so, so more, more stable or more... Uh, I can't compare that. In the long cavity, we use the diffraction grating. In the short cavity, we use the volume break grating. And that has different uh, feedback parameters. So uh, experimentally, I can't tell you that, but... Um, uh, the alignment will become more difficult in some sense, but uh, the, uh, the intrinsic shallow trunks line width should improve on the cavity. I have a question myself. Um, it's about the device, because it's, yeah. well, it's a long time you work with Rotavia mixes. Yeah. So um, how has it changed the fabrication process 10 years ago to now? Is, is this commercially done? Is it improving or not? I'm sure there's a diamond on it. That, that, <laughs> no, that was already 10 years ago or so. Uh, but they improved a lot. Are they getting, I mean, are they getting more smooth and, and broader? So what, what the initial devices had were, were large gradients. And on top of this, there was this disorder. But due to this large long-term gradient, actually we didn't see very much of the disorder. Now... Uh, this is much better, so essentially we see like that, but now we see this, uh, small, this, this small scale. And as I said, this is essentially if you, the, the, de the data and frequency, if you relate this to a, a fluctuation of cavity lengths, you arrive that this sensitivity is smaller than a monolayer. And there, there's essentially no idea how, how you could uh, control this on a monolayer level spatial resolved. So they, they are only looking at, so they have no possibility if an atom is missing at some point to put in another atom. It's a stochastic growth process and it's controlled on the level of uh, the whole thing. So that's for fundamental reasons the best. It, it seems to be that uh, maybe you can do a little bit better. You can look maybe for for uh, slightly uh, nice devices. There will be a little bit temperature, and some annealing that might help. But uh, for commercial devices, this is sufficient. 
and currently no grower is interested to optimize cavity soil plants uh, <laughs> to invest a lot of time no, in so, so there, there might be some possibility if you change growth conditions, do some annealing, that some of these steps might disappear, uh, uh, but that would demand quite an effort by a grower and I don't see primarily. So the devices in your lab are custom made or a commercial out of the shop? Uh, they're essentially custom made because the commercial market uh, doesn't really exist for, 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 for them. So, uh, Open Photonic is promoting them for these medium brightness applications, but it didn't take off. Didn't take off. So, you can buy them commercially or slightly different versions, but uh, it's not a mass market. Okay. And there are uh, but the size of the soviton is larger probably than this is more food. So uh, uh, a soviton sees several of these fluctuations and I guess that the trapping of where you raised is something bigger, the difference than just one monoia. Am I right? Or is just one monoia that determines where this is a trapping point or the point where you can raise the soviton? So, so some of the steps we see are more than monolayer, mono but you can make some back of the envelope calculation that the monolayer is enough to, to trap them. The so one will be enough to trap them, yeah. just one atom more from one yeah. uh, And so this thing is on the order of 2 to 5 microns or, or whatever, but this is what we see, what you can probe by optical means. It might be that there's uh, even more below it on smaller scales, but since we are probing optically, we don't see it. So the soliton was average over this very small scales, but... Uh, but, but the difference in scale would be what just one apple. Yeah. So, so there, 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 there's more, but uh, it's enough. One monolayer is enough to, 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 to do that. Uh, it was interesting for me that you, that you described the first part of your talk as the fundamental physics and the last one as the applied one. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you can you didn't say that. Yeah, no, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> now, he was the <laughs> now, these solitons, I mean, uh, people have been talking about them for uh, more than 10 years with the idea of doing information processing, blah, blah, blah. But this does not happen yet. Yeah. Why? What, what is the what is the barrier? Yeah, one one barrier is obvious that uh, that uh, the potential would be massive parallelism, but this massive parallelism is hindered by the disorder. So, and the other thing is that the uh, speed is on the order of a nanosecond. And that is good for packet switching, but for that it would be good. Uh, but currently, uh, the commercial opinion is that that's easier to do with commercial techniques if, if you still need to, need to worry about the layer of and things like that. So, so is, it, is, is, there, is there any real future in applications of that thing? Or? It depends a little bit on which direction you think the whole communication business uh, goes. So, I mean, it's not only solitons, essentially all optical switching, all, all optical switching techniques are not in the field. That doesn't depend on whether it's solitons, I mean, there are plenty of other suggestions. So currently the industry says optics is good for transmission, but it's not good for processing. Um, Electronics electronic is, is harder to be done probably with yeah, and, uh, and that is uh, true for all, all optical technologies, not only for the solitons. But there the additional problem is the, if you want to really apply it, you have the massive parallelism, but that is kind of hindered by the solitons. Now the other question is, in your last part, I mean you were uh, unbalanced with the thing with optical pumping, right? Yeah. Is there any hope, thought, or ideas to do that with uh, uh, spin polarized uh, electrical current? So the estimations say that maybe uh, 
the imbalance we need. Currently, you are very close to get at uh, at uh, 200, uh, 200 Kelvin with an additional magnetic field. So these these spin polarizations would be roughly what you need. But of course, this is still 50 Kelvin, depending where you live. Uh, for you, it's probably 80 Kelvin or so off. <laughs> and, uh, and the magnetic field is also not very attractive. But there's a big industry of people working to get that to get that done. Uh, and yeah, for for the LED, uh, yeah, the room temperature there are demonstrations. Okay, so we sit here and let's thank Tosten again. Is the same as the central absorption, so I think I wanted to mention.